What's up guys? Hey. It's Phil and Alex from the third space. Welcome back. Coming to you again with another exciting episode. Yep. And uh, we know it's been a while, but we're actually trying to do this a bit more regularly again. Anyway, so. It'd be like that sometimes. So listen to this. If you guys love our content, you like you guys like what we're doing over here, yeah. please like and subscribe, help us grow the community so we reach out to more people and give out that free health information. Yeah, um, and by the way, Today, we're going to be breaking down a few medical myths and misconceptions that people might have about certain things. In fact, some of you probably believe these myths, but today we're going to debunk a whole bunch of them. So stay tuned. Okay, so let's just jump right into it. Myth number one, shocking a patient who has flatline saves lives. Now, what do I mean by this? Have you guys ever seen a movie scene or series where a surgery starts going wrong or the patient starts crashing and the nurses bring in a defibrillator? That's the machine they use to shock patients, by the way. Um, this concept is known as flatlining. What is flatlining? So when you hear the doctor go clear, <laughs> after the machine goes beep, 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 and then beep. Basically, that's the flat line we're talking about. Yeah. And in more accurate medical terms, it's called um, asystole. So asystole basically means that there's no electrical impulses going through the heart to make it pump. Because yeah. the primary aim of the heart is to have it pump. So when you have asystole, there's no pumping of blood because of no electrical impulses. So um, in medical school, we learned that there's two instances where basically uh, you're not supposed to shock the patient yeah. because there's no electrical impulses. So that's asystole and then PEA, which is a uh, pulseless electrical activity. Yeah, so basically the movies are lying to you. In order to shock a patient, you actually need electricity already running through the heart because what shocking does is it manipulates that electricity or rearranges it in a way that it can become synchronous. So the muscles of the heart can beat like together in unison, you understand, in order to produce a heartbeat. So shocking a patient without electricity through the heart does not make sense at all. So who knew your heart was like a little power box just going on and off? Yeah. <laughs> so this is why we do not shock patients with asystole or PEA because you're essentially just frying them. Right? Right? So, and this is why we do what is called chest compressions when you have PEA or when somebody has a somebody flatlines yeah. because you're you're basically squeezing the anterior part of the of the chest to the posterior part of the chest to make sure that the blood is pumped through the cavity. Yeah. Um, so basically, chest compressions are what jump starts the heart, and shocking just allows you to arrange that electricity so the heart can beat better. The shocking itself doesn't jump start the heart. Shocking, isn't it? <laughs> the pun was not intended. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now, myth number two. Humans only use 10% of their brain. This, by the way, is something most of us have probably heard and probably believed. In fact, entire movie franchises have been made on this theory. Things such as Limitless or Lucy are films that we've all watched and believed to happen. The idea is that if you're able to somehow access 90% of your remaining brain capacity, you'll be able to access superhuman abilities, things such as psychic powers or actually be able to fly. This sounds absolutely absurd and Cassie will tell you why. It is absolutely insane to assume that the entire human brain for the rest of your life only performs at 10% of, of its yeah. best. Because when you study uh, neurophysiology, which is the study of how the brain functions, you start to realize that certain regions of the brain have been developed to perform certain functions. Yeah. When we talk about our frontal lobe, which is more for, uh, which is responsible for your personality, for your cognition, and your speech production, we talk about your temporal lobe, which is more um, specialized in memory and hearing. You talk about your occipital lobe, which is responsible for your seeing, and then your cerebellum, which is for um, balance mm. and other important functions. You start to realize that 10% of all those bodily functions is absolutely insane. Like the yeah. math is not mathy. Yeah, that, that, that math is absolutely off. It makes zero sense at all. And um, this is even further driven by the fact that your brain only takes up 2% of your entire body mass, but it uses almost 20% of all the energy your body consumes. Even more math that doesn't math. So it's impossible for, use, to, for you to use only 10% of your brain capacity. Uh, I think that myth is debunked. 
So the third myth is in how people think that doctors are bound by some sacred oath um, that makes them slaves to service, yeah. first and foremost, where people forget that before they are doctors, they are humans first. And I'm talking about the Hippocratic Oath, if you haven't picked up on it yet. Um, and this is the Hippocratic Oath, where uh, we swear to serve our patients first, cause no harm, non-maleficent, yeah. um, um, which basically makes people think that they're entitled to a doctor's time. Yeah. Um, so we swear to serve all patients and all that stuff is part of the oath but the actual hypocritic oath is pretty problematic in its own way um, this is because the ancient text itself requires a certain level of chastity a certain level of charity as well as pledging allegiance to gods that i'm pretty sure my mother never taught me to pray these are pagan gods by the way um, so let me quote it directly from the text so i swear by apollo the physician and asclepius and hagia and panacea invoking all the gods and goddesses to be my witnesses that I will fulfill this oath and this written covenant to the best of my powers and of my judgment. I will look upon him who shall have taught me this art, even as on my own parents. I will share with him my substance and supply his necessities if he is in need. I will not give a woman a pursery to procure abortion, but I will keep my life and my art in purity and holiness. I will not use the knife, not even virily. So basically in the modern times where the Hippocratic Oath says I am bound to treat with a knife yeah. and I'm supposed to receive money and you know uh, where they condemn things like abortion where in certain instances I might have to perform an, an abortion yeah. amongst other reasons to save a person's life. Yeah. Um, so this is absolutely absurd and if you haven't seen our video on abortion please click in one of these corners we're going to link it up here yeah. and then you just understand what we're talking about. All right, so the ancient Hippocratic Oath actually brings out quite a lot of problems for us modern practitioners because like he said, sometimes abortions are done if we need to save the mother's life, we need to do surgery, and um, sometimes we actually we're taught not to give patients money. That's crossing a very serious ethical line. So the next myth is um, when you read in dim lights, you're actually weakening your eyes. Yeah. That's at the untrue yeah <laughs> <laughs> my my french um because basically when you're reading in dim light is that you're just essentially straining your muscles your eye muscles uh that makes them work a little extra harder but this can simply be resolved by going to sleep yeah um now the theory probably comes from the fact that like people who read for longer periods of time or for quite a few years or people who spend most of their days focusing up close on certain things like people who spend the whole day in front of, co of a computer are more susceptible or can develop something known as myopia which um, in layman's terms is basically termed nearsightedness and these people can develop this over a long period of time it actually has nothing to do with reading in dim light like he said all you you can do to fix the strain that you cause with dim light is sleeping. I have my own. <laughs> oh dude, <laughs> tough. <laughs> Leave that in. Myth number five. Um, so shaving your hair makes it grow back faster and stronger. This is a myth that has been existent and I'm probably sure you heard about it since the 18th century and uh, we're here to let you know it is untrue. Yeah, um, so here's the thing. Um, lots of studies have, done, have been done about this. Um, like you said, even way back in the 18th century. In fact, in 1970, a study was done whereby five men were asked to shave one leg and leave the other one unshaved for several months. Now, by the end of this study, the leg that was shaved did not have hair that was either thicker nor did it grow faster than the unshaved leg and despite numerous studies debunking this theory for some reason the myth continues to persist see when you have um hair growing in certain places as a teenager most yeah. often you do not notice your hair in those aspects until you contemplate on shaving it mm. so when you do shave it then it appears to grow back faster and stronger but see what happens is that this is psychological because you didn't know you had hair growing there and secondly it's because it's the, you have a hormonal surge yeah. which is responsible for your secondary sexual characteristics which primarily one of them is hair growth so you notice it growing back faster but only because it's in the mind and because you have a hormone surge going on yeah so it's not growing any faster it was already growing you already have hormones implanted in you to make it grow um, other people also think that cutting 
cutting their hair like completely bald and letting it grow back makes it grow back thicker. That's not really true because all you did was cut the hair that was quite old and already light in texture. The one that's growing or spouting now is the newer, fresher cells that are growing and that's why you maybe think it's thicker or newer but it's, it's basically just your hair. You just cut the old hair off. So yeah, um, there you go. At mm. five minutes we've debunked um, here on the third space. Yeah. If you like this video, this type of content that we put out today, like and comment down in the comment section below um, on myths you want us to debunk and we'll make part two. Yeah, and uh, by the way, just share this video with other people if you can. Like we said, it really helps us out. This YouTube game is pretty hard. Uh, hope you learned something new today. My name is Alex. This is Phil and this, this is, is the third space. space. <laughs>